All right, and now we are going to proceed to talk about Riemann normal coordinates. I wanted to step back a little bit and go back to this old catalog of space times. We talked a lot about this in the earlier part of the lecture, and I don't want to forget it because our goal is to understand it. Our goal is that you can go to this thing, the catalog of space times, go through it, understand everything that's in there. That would be a great, uh, if you can do that, you certainly are a qualified, knowledgeable about general relativity. And um, we will uh, refer to it today just to get back into the document. Uh, it's, this is where it's at, by the way, if you want to find it. Uh, it's free online, and these great authors we have to thank for. I don't know uh, who they are, but uh, we should uh, be very grateful for their work. Uh, if they were rock stars, I'd send them a, f a fan letter. But as it is, uh, look at the uh, this, this logo that they chose. This is actually pretty interesting because it goes back to the material we were talking about one lesson ago. Notice how they draw this manifold. They call the manifold M. And remember, when we do it, we used to say, oh, the whole whiteboard is the manifold. So we're kind of looking at the manifold from above or something like that. And our manifold is always appears to be flat because we just, that's how I draw it. But clearly, they're, they're giving this manifold some flexion inside space. This is actually a kind of an interesting idea. It's one of these things where they're, you know, these are the kinds of sketches that help communicate ideas, but they can be a bit misleading. And in this case, what's misleading is that you'll see that the manifold has some obvious, what we would colloquially call curvature, and it's embedded. It's a two-dimensional manifold embedded in a three-dimensional space. So out here, you know, we have three dimensions, X, Y, Z. Uh, this is right-handed, not that it matters. Somebody pointed out that I had a left-handed coordinate system in a previous lecture uh, in a circumstance where it was irrelevant. Here it's not relevant either. The point is it's three dimensions. Um, and uh, the manifold itself is clearly two dimensions, and the coordinates are actually laid out. These curvilinear coordinates are laid out on top of it. This idea of embedding a manifold of lower dimension into a space of a higher dimension is really where our intuition really wants to go. We really want to see things that way. We understand curvature in terms of spheres or, or if not spheres, you know, these uh, hyperbolic surfaces, right? Um, that, uh, uh, how would I draw that? You know, I, I just tried to do some drawing of hyperbolic surface. I can't do it. So uh, we'll just live with the idea of a sphere. But the point is it's all this idea that it's embedded in the three-dimensional space is really good for our imagination, but that's really not what we're talking about. I actually prefer uh, keeping the flat plane like I do, you know, and just sort of drawing these arbitrary coordinate lines and implying that the curvature is all embedded in the mathematical concept of the metric. And that's actually what Riemannian geometry is all about. It takes away the necessity to embed a curved surface in a higher space of higher dimensionality. The curvature is intrinsic to the surface. Right? The curvature is the, it's built into the metric structure of the space itself and has no dependence whatsoever on the embedding in a higher dimensionality space. In fact, if this manifold was, um, say, for example, the surface of a Klein bottle, you couldn't even embed it in a one-dimensionally higher space. So, and yet the Klein bottle is still a manifold. It can still have a metric. It still can have intrinsic curvature. And... Um, uh, so, so, but this is forgivable, right? Because this is how we do things. I'm not complaining about this, by the way. I'm just pointing out that we should be beyond uh, the necessity at this point in your work. You should be beyond the necessity of having to visualize curved space-time as a literally curved thing, right? If If you're still there, then I don't think you're totally comfortable yet with the whole notion of the metric, the connection, and that the fact is that the curvature is all embedded in these mathematical ideas. Anyway, so that aside, what else do they, they have in this little sketch? Well, at this point P, you'll notice this is our, this is a point, we'll call that point P in the manifold. Um, there's a tangent space at P, right? And what do I usually do? I usually kind of separate it with a little box. I call this tangent space T of P. And I say it has a uh, four dimensions. It's a real vector space. And then I say it has a basis. 
And sure enough, the basis is partial x1, or I would call it partial, uh, partial x, I guess, mu here. I would just go partial mu, which um, that's what this is supposed to be if I blow that up. You know, that should be partial x1. We would just write that as partial 1, right, in, in our work. But, um, uh, but this illustrates, you know, that th this, is, this is his way or their way of, whoops, of writing the, uh, the coordinate basis at that particular tangent point, right? And every tangent, every point has a tangent plane, and every one of those will have a coordinate basis. And this is a nice little illustration of the coordinate basis. Um, it's an important concept, so they put it in the logo of their amazing catalog. And then um, over here, uh, what is this? Well, we just learned about this, right? This tangent po point at Q, or the tangent plane, the tangent space at the point Q of the manifold. See, I try to get my language exactly right. I, I say it's sloppy, and then I say, oh, that's sloppy, and I go back and kind of try to fix it. The point Q is in the manifold, right? Q is an element of the manifold M, right? And the, the tangent space at the point Q, right? That tangent space has a basis. Well, they has, but bases are not unique, right? And in this case, the coordinate basis is one basis. There is a coordinate basis here too, right? There is a coordinate basis available to T of Q, tangent space of Q, but there's also an arbitrary basis, E1, E mu. And E mu will always be E mu A partial, uh, uh, whoops, uh, how would I do this? It would be, actually it shouldn't be mu, that's the problem, yeah, of course I screwed this up. It would be the eighth basis vector on E is E A mu partial mu. The, uh, the confusion there is we like to I like to keep the Greek letters for the coordinate basis and the Latin letters for uh, a non holonomic uh, frame field or frame basis uh, a tetrad basis at the point Q. Um, other books will put parentheses around it just to make it absolutely clear. Other books will do E A hat equals E A hat mu partial mu. But the point is, though, is that this is an important enough concept that, or an interesting enough concept or an illustratable enough concept that uh, they threw it there inside their logo for the catalog. Okay, so this is a reminder about the catalog. Go get it. And... Um, uh, we're going to uh, use it a little bit and start pushing our, our understanding of it even further uh, than we did before. Okay, so back to Riemann normal coordinates. What did we learn last time? Well, last time we set up the Riemann normal coordinate system, and we learned that in the Riemann normal coordinate system, all geodesics, right, geodesic paths parameterized by some parameter tau uh, can be expressed by a series of constants times tau. That is, geodesic paths in the Riemann normal coordinate system are straight lines. We actually basically took, we, now notice how we did this. We started from an arbitrary coordinate system on the space-time, right, with its uh, coordinate, uh, where every tangent space has its coordinate basis all set up nice, just like we saw a moment ago. I guess I could do it their way, psi 2 and partial 1, partial 2. And we use that uh, to come up with a concept about how to create a coordinate system that would uh, uh, have the property that geodesics in the coordinate system uh, are straight lines. Now, when we say that, we understand, of course, that we're talking about coordinate systems that are relatively local, right? local to the point where the geodesics don't cross, right? Because geodesics could, after a while, actually cross, right? So we've got, to, we've got to set this up in a way where the geodesics aren't crossing. So it's sort of somewhat local. So the Riemann coordinate system uh, would exist in a somewhat local area. And uh, from this, once we realized that fact, we asked ourselves, well, okay, what, what do, how... Because we constructed it literally using the geodesic equation, which I've repeated up here, 
a, a print form of it, um, we were able to take this form and substitute it into the geodesic equation and solve for the connection coefficients of our Riemann normal coordinate system. Now, let's do that. Now, here's a good exercise in just the general idea of, um, uh, uh, of doing this kind of mathematics. The ge general relativity has a lot of mathematical uh, um, language that uh, it's, it's redundant, it's confusing, and oh, I shouldn't say redundant. I, I guess it's not, it's highly non-unique, right? So like, look at this equation here and then look what I just wrote down. So I was very casual. Oh, we've got a, we've got geodesic paths and they're parameterized by tau and there's some constants and this is a linear form. But you have to be able to look at this and translate this right away. When I say a geodesic path parameterized by tau, you know what that means is that there's a real line with a parameter tau that starts at zero and goes to, you know, uh, some arbitrarily large number, I suppose. Um, uh, there is a limit on this, right? Uh, there's a thing called geodesically complete and things like that. But let's just say it goes to one for now. Let's just say we're talking about a segment of a path that goes from zero to one. And we know that that maps onto the space time and you get the first coordinate you get a formula for the second coordinate, well, the, the zero coordinate, the time coordinate, the first space coordinate of tau, the second space coordinate, ah, oh, my mess, what a mess, right? You get these uh, expressions for the various coordinates of tau, and that translates into a path that starts at g of zero, and this point here is the start, that's g mu of zero, and it sort of wanders through the space-time geodesically, Right, and it ends up at g mu of one. That you're thinking that when you see this, right? And in our in this coordinate system, in the coordinate system of Riemann co normal coordinates, that thing actually looks like a straight line, right? A straight line. Now, um, uh, but I want to now sort of examine it using the geodesic equation. So I go to a book and I pull out the geodesic equation. And so now this has to be inserted into this. But, well, what is this? Well, this is, the, being the geodesic equation, it's claiming by its very definition that geodesics are written as x mu of s, right? That's their, that's what this is. That is uh, the path in space-time, x mu. The parameter of that path is s. Right? And so they're using S as the parameter and X mu as the geodesic. And, you know, when I scribbled it out and thought about it, I did this. So you have to, you know, obviously, I, I know this is almost elementary, but it's worth saying this is an obstruction to learning this material. Is Every book has sort of a different notation, a different uh, feel on how they, they choose to do it. There's a book that doesn't even like to do this. They, they would rather write X alpha dot. Right, where dot means d by ds, the parameter, right? And so this whole equation would be x double dot mu plus um, uh, gamma mu alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta equals zero, right? That's This is another way of writing the equation. And notice my choice, too, was gamma mu alpha beta, not gamma mu alpha beta, right? I have the space here, right? Now, my space makes it look like a tensor, which it isn't, right? So that's a problem. This not having the space reminds you it's not a tensor, but I think everybody who's at this point had better know that the connection is not a tensor. I like that because I want to remind myself that there is also this connection, right? There's these other types of Christoffel connections, which are, in fact, lowered index, just like you, uh, you would lower the index as though it was a tensor. And I like to know where this thing is going to go, right? There's some ambiguity. If you lower mu, does it go there? Does it go there? Does it go there? Anyway, so I prefer that. Anyway, the point being that uh, clearly this guy, uh, uh, the authors of this, or I can't, I don't remember exactly where I pulled out the GED's equation here, but whoever this was, they didn't do it. Let's see what the space-time catalog does. Here's a here's me pulling it out from the space-time catalog, so they don't do it either, right? They don't do it either. Uh, but you see, it's it's raised and lowered, and in fact, um, they, uh, they lower it to the end, right? So that mu, when it drops, it drops to the end on theirs, on their version of it. 
So the mu goes down to the end. Huh, interesting. Okay, I think I made note of that earlier uh, in the earlier part of this lecture. I, I, sh I probably shouldn't be surprised by this. I probably noticed this before. You know, um, looking at this, uh, it makes no sense that I would be telling you guys, hey, we're going to work our way through the catalog of space-time, and then I have a naturally uh, adopted a convention that's different. Um, this this, uh, this uh, footnote here actually talks about the distinct different conventions. So I'm going to now adopt the convention of the catalog of space-time. I know at some point I'll screw this up, I promise you, but um, so this whole little story I told you about the up and down indices, well, I'm changing it. So I'm going to now uh, struggle to maintain this uh, this set of notation. Anyway, where were we? So uh, so there's this there's this form, and you've got especially when you see these dots, right? The x double dot mu. It's like, well, what the hell are we dotting here? Well, we're we're dotting the parameterized uh, the the parameter, right? The pr that parameter is what we're uh, taking the second derivative of. So. We now, in order to exploit this, we have to kind of convert this to this form. Well, I use tau, and they use s for a parameter. Well, that's a trivial change, but there is some messaging going on here, right? Because tau is almost always considered the proper time, right? We like to say tau is, is, the, is the ticking of the clock as you move along the geodesic path. This is how your clock is naturally ticking. We like to think of this affine parameter as the proper time, and tau is similar to time, but we like to reserve t for the coordinate time, which is not real, not the same thing, right? So we go with this Greek letter tau. Now, so when I see a tau, my mind tends to think, oh, this is a time-like geodesic. Uh, let me uh, 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 let me go over here, I guess. This is a time-like geodesic. Well, what does that mean? That means that lo that locally, right? You know that that the this geodesic path is moving through space, always, whoops, at an uh, always maintaining a uh, angle of less than forty-five degrees, which of course is not what's going on right there. So that's a bad drawing, but it's sort of winding its way through space-time. You know, it's getting close to the speed of light here, but it's never faster than the speed of light. And so from that, we say it's time-like and its parameterization, that is, the length along this path, right, is tau. The point is, though, we're developing a coordinate system, a Riemann normal coordinate system. So we have to sort of think back what this means. If this is our point in space-time where we're establishing the Riemann normal coordinate system, we need to be able to label every point in space-time with coordinates, right? Every point around it. And some of those points are in the past life, life cone. Um, uh, some of them are in the future light cone. So some of those points have time-like separation from our point. But there's plenty of points that do not, right? All these points have space-like separation. And yet there are still geodesics that connect those points, right? Geodesics do not have to be time-like. They have to be time-like to be physically traversable, but they don't have to be time-like to uh, be relevant to capturing coordinates in four-dimensional space-time. In fact, most of them, or many of them at least, are not. So the, uh, so the parameter S kind of is, good, is a good choice because it breaks us, uh, breaks us out of the well, it breaks me, I should say me. I shouldn't presume that the listener here has the same uh, pre, pre, predil, predilection, preconception, prejudice, the same prejudice for time-like geodesics. So S is our parameter here. So, so now I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to write X mu of S equals A mu of S. And now that is the same content as this, but it's now ready to examine here. And we did this in the last lecture. We we took the geodesic equation. We substituted, we substituted this form, and from that you immediately conclude that gamma mu alpha beta. Look at me using the new cor new convention equals zero. It must equal zero, right? The only way that this geodesic equation can be solved for um, uh, an arbitrary straight lined geodesic 
is if the connection coefficients are zero. So now we're going to take an approach to this that starts from more fundamental considerations and using the geodesic equation and uh, the Einstein equivalence principle, the Einstein equivalence principle, we are going to prove that Riemann normal coordinates exist. So instead of setting them up, what we did in the previous lecture is we took our point and we said we're going to connect everything to other points using geodesics, and lo and behold, notice that any other geodesic that goes through our point at this point can be described as a constant a mu s, or as a straight line. So we constructed coordinates and discovered that they yielded straight lines. Now we're going to start from the Einstein equivalence principle and create Riemann normal coordinates that way. All right, so how do we do this? Well, first we have to formulate the Einstein equivalence principle mathematically. And we did this actually in one of the earliest lectures in this course. We, we actually derived the geodesic equation from the Einstein equivalence principle. So uh, we can now assume the geodesic equation uh, from the Einstein equivalence principle because I've actually proven that. I've actually done that. Um, you may have to go back to one of the earlier lectures. But if we assume the Einstein equivalence principle, this is acceptable to assume. And But the big point, of course, in the Einstein equivalence principle is that we can always get created at any point in space-time, any single point in space-time, we can always find an inertial coordinate system. And that is tantamount to saying that the uh, metric of space-time at our point P, if I called that the point P, the metric of space-time at point P is equal to the Minkowski metric. and we'll, So we'll assume Cartesian coordinates right now. So the Minkowski metric will always be expressible in uh, diag minus 1, 1, 1, 1. Some books, of course, will have 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, right? But we're going to, I'm going to try to stick with this one. Oh, and uh, sometimes what you'll see is this. You'll see a little exclamation point here to indicate that this is in a unique coordinate system, right? So what we've basically we're saying is we know that you can always do this, right? So there is some unique coordinate system where this is true. And there's, it's like, it's, it's doubly unique, I guess, in some sense, right? What we're really saying is that the metric, there's a coordinate system where the metric is flat. But when I say that metric is, is the Minkowski metric, I'm not only saying that it's flat, but I'm also saying that it's Cartesian, right? So I, of all the flat space-times out there, you know, I could, I could have a spherical coordinate system. I could have a, 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 an, oblate, an oblate coordinate system. There's all these weird coordinate systems you could have, but they're all flat, right? Their metrics, the, the flat metric is always weird, but I can always take those metrics and I can transform to a Cartesian metric, and that's what this implies, right? So I can always get there. Um, and, and, and by the way, that, that's not even unique, right? Because there's plenty of flat space-time metrics that are in relative motion to one another. They're all different by only a Lorentz transformation. So this is, there's a lot you can do to get this. But that's what the Einstein equivalence principle says, at least, is that this is true. But the Einstein equivalence principle also gives us this. And all motion in this reference frame that exists at this point in space-time is inertial. And what that tells us is that this term has to go away, right? Otherwise, um, uh, your accelerations um, along the geodesic would not be zero. And that's the whole point of an inertial reference frame is, is it's not is the, the free-falling objects or, are not accelerating in that reference frame. So all this has to go away, which tells us that gamma mu alpha beta must equal zero. So that's the Einstein equivalence principle. That's how we take the Einstein equivalence principle and give it mathematical teeth, right? Uh, with the caveat that I've proven this from the Einstein equivalence principle in a previous uh, lecture. Okay, so starting with this, let's go back to the catalog of space-times, right? So this is a page, go to the catalog of space-time. This is section 1.3 of the catalog of space-times. Let's have a look at this expression for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, right? 
Uh, we could do this with a Christoffel symbol of the second kind, which is the one we're using. But the first thing we would do is we would just get rid of this by lowering the indices on G and turning it essentially into the Christoffel symbol the first time. So let's look at this guy. Um, going from, I better do this in red, from here to here is pretty simple, right? You, you simply write this expression, which has the order mu, uh, nu, lambda, mu, right? Uh, uh, well, I guess they don't even have them here. Well, here you have mu, lambda, uh, nu, lambda, mu. You have that sequence here. You create this for the sequence mu, nu, lambda, and mu, lambda, nu, right? You just switch the last two and add. And what you'll discover is everything cancels except for this term right here. So this and this are exactly the same. So we can assume that this is true, right? You can assume that this is true because this is this is the levi civita uh, t uh, met, uh, connection, right? If you have a metric, if you have a metric on the space time, which means you know this function, you know, oops, right? You know this function, g mu nu on the space time, which means you can take its derivative. So you can calculate g mu nu single bar lambda. Remember, I use a single bar when they use a comma. Remember, I complain, always complained about the comma, but I'm sticking with my single bar. Uh, it's a lot easier uh, on this whiteboard, and I just think it looks better. And I hate, uh, it. Just this just reminds me of freaking English grammar, and I was so bad at that. I can't even spell or do any of that stuff. So I, I don't like using commas. It gives me, I trigger. These commas trigger me. They trigger me. So, which is really tough because commas are everywhere. Anyway, everywhere in GR books. But the more modern ones are using this, this line, which I like better. Remember, the covariant derivative is two lines, right? So this is not the covariant derivative. So G mu nu comma lambda, ouch, that hurt, equals G mu nu line lambda, which is defined as partial lambda g mu nu, which is defined as um, uh, partial g mu nu partial x lambda, all right? See, that's, that's how all this notation works. Okay, so getting back to uh, where we're at, this is what's important, right? We... Uh, once we know, I'm sorry, once we know that the metric on the space-time exists, we can calculate this, right? Given the metric, you calculate this. From that, you run it through this formula. You end up with the first kind connection. You raise it using the metric. You end up with the second kind connection. And that's the thing that lives in our geodesic equation, right? So the metric forces a connection on the space-time. Now, given that... Uh, I can calculate these derivatives of the metric, right? I can calculate these derivatives of the metric. You know, let me just figure this up so I stop triggering, right? Let me just do that. Do, 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 do. Oh, I feel so much better. Okay. Um, so, but what have we just, what do we know? We know that in an inertial reference frame, in an inertial reference frame, we know that these guys are zero. These second kinds are zero, which means the first kinds are zero too, right? And from that, with that in mind, these two guys are zero. So this is zero plus zero. So in our inertial reference frame, the first derivatives of the metric are also all zero, right? Okay, so now we can add that to our list of things we're assuming. Well, I shouldn't say assuming. Those are the things. Well, I guess we are assuming because this is all from the assumption of the Einstein equivalence principle. So... With the accepting the Einstein equivalence principle as an axiom implies that we have a coordinate system where g mu nu, this guy at, at least one point, at least one point is equal to the Minkowski metric. And at that one point, uh, these guys are all zero. The connection co Christoffel symbols are all zero. Uh, the, I, the connection coefficients, Christoffel symbols, are all zero. And the first derivative of the metric is then there go necessarily zero. So let's summarize that here, right? Uh, G, oops. 
So this is our summary of things that we know about a coordinate system that exists on this manifold, right? There's a coordinate system that exists on the manifold, but at the point P, we know that the value of the metric on that coordinate system is Minkowski, and by that I'm, I'm for, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be Cartesian Minkowski, or flat Cartesian, which is this metric right here. Uh, I won't force a convention on us right now. The at that point P, at that point P, the derivative of the metric is zero, right? And at that point P, the connection is zero. Don't forget, the connection is a function on the space-time, as is clearly indicated in this in this GDZ equation. The connection itself is not a constant on the space-time. And we've only found a coordinate system that makes it zero at this one point, right? But these things are all true given the Einstein equivalence principle. By the way, I, it's important, it's worth noting that um, we emphasize that all this is true at the point P. It turns out you can even do better than that. You can find, if you have a geodesic that goes through P, like if there's some geodesic here, I can define a coordinate system, a global coordinate system, a global coordinate system every, you know, everywhere, where this stuff is all true along this geodesic that goes through P. So the coordinate system always maintains this through P. And that, of course, is the freely falling coordinate system. If you're freely falling, which means P is that you're, fall, you're looking at all the points in the space-time that are along a freely falling geodesic, you can find a coordinate system for which this is true at every one of those points. That is called a Fermi normal coordinates. Those are called Fermi normal coordinates, and they're very cool. Um, we don't, we're not worrying about that right now. We just want to get this nailed down for one point in the space-time. All right, so now we begin with our manifold, right? So this is our version of space-time, similar to the little picture I was talking about earlier in the uh, cover of the catalog. And in our manifold, we will lay down an arbitrary coordinate system. This is an arbitrary coordinate system, right? How do we know we can do this? You should know the answer to that question. We can do this because it is a, an assumption of the theory that um, space-time is a four-dimensional manifold. And by being a manifold, that means you can always put down a coordinate system. So then we choose our point P that we care so much about. And this is the place where we are now going to find a new coordinate system where the point P has uh, uh, these properties, right? These basic properties that we talked about right here. Maybe, maybe I should just take those and move them over. Yeah, I'll take those. I will put them here. Shrink them down because they're so important. We'll take note of this and uh, that we're seeking a coordinate system that has these properties, which are now probably too small for you to read. Okay. Um, so on this manifold, right, we have, by the by very nature of things, we have a metric on this space-time, and it's a function of these coordinates x, where x is this coordinate system, right? And the metric, of course, gives us a uh, alpha, beta, gamma, it gives us a connection. That's a function on x. And these functions at P have some value that are not satisfying this because this is an arbitrary coordinate system, one best picked out, out at random. There's no reason to think that at point P, this arbitrary coordinate system has this, these properties. In fact, there's no reason, it's not even true that an arbitrary coordinate system, you're guaranteed that one point P somewhere has these properties. That's not true either, right? So, uh, we just have an arbitrary coordinate system and we've arbitrarily picked one point out of that coordinate system. Okay. Uh, I guess there's one other thing I should point out. When I say we cover the manifold with a coordinate system, being a manifold, that doesn't mean, means you can't necessarily cover the whole manifold with a single coordinate system, right? So in principle, I guess the way to think about this is that there is a, uh, uh, a, co a, a coordinate patch, right? of the manifold that is covered with this coordinate system. And then presumably there's some other coordinate patch over here that has its own coordinate system. And then there's this overlap region, right? Where you can transform from one system to another. 
so the manifold, so we're obviously dealing with one patch of a manifold, right? And we can now look at, say, let's, let, we're going to take cut a patch out of this manifold right around P. And in this patch, we're going to erect a different coordinate system, right? A different coordinate system that does have these properties at P, right? So notice all the assumptions we've built in here, right? The first assumption is that you can create this patch with this coordinate system. And you know that because the assumption of the theory, the axiomatic construction of general relativity says it's a manifold and therefore, ergo, you can do this because that's what manifolds are. Manifolds are things that have coordinate systems. And I can take it for many manifold, I can always create an arbitrary uh, uh, chart of a given section of the manifold and put another coordinate system on that, which I can do. The fact that this coordinate system has these properties, right, has our, our golden properties, our inertial properties, that is also uh, an axiomatic from the theory based on the Einstein equivalence principle. So I'm using the Einstein equivalence principle axiom here. I'm using the, the four-dimensional manifold axiom here. So everything is done based on fundamental assumptions of the theory. So this coordinate system, this new coordinate system, I'm going to use the letters, the Greek letters, E, I guess I'll call this one, epsilon, uh, E, uh, this is a, a eta, right? Right, I think that's eta. Uh, no, 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 it's psi, right? This is meant to be, that's the way it should look, right? And that's the Greek letter xi, the lowercase xi. But I'm going to write it like this, right? So that's it's meant to be the lowercase i. So this coordinate system here, the coordinate system on this new patch, though our, our inertial system, or our system which is inertial at P, right? And by the definition meaning inertial at P, that means it has these properties, right? That's synonymous. Inertial at P means these properties are satisfied. And, uh, but this patch obviously overlaps this patch, right? So I can write the transformation equations, right? The transformation equations would look something like E mu, um, the, the coordinates of some point uh, are, are functions of E mu of the coordinates in the other system, right? So this is saying that the coordinates of a point X, right, the coordinates of a point X, these are formulas, right? This You put in the coordinates in the old system or in the black system, and it pumps out the coordinates in the new system, right? So we can write it this way. You don't actually, I don't even know if you need this part, right? We just know that that exists. And likewise, of course, the reverse exists too, right? I can write x mu uh, of psi, right? right? If I know the coordinates of a point on the overlap in the psi coordinates, the inertial at p psi coordinates, I also can calculate the coordinates in this. I can do that. Those are transition functions. These are the transition functions in this overlap region. Just so happens this overlap region is entirely, uh, the way I've drawn it, it's entirely contained. Our little patch here is entirely contained in this big patch. Or I should say the chart region is, well, let's see, the, the um, yeah, the chart region uh, are totally contained. Uh, which isn't totally uncommon. In fact, it's necessary in this case. But the point is we know these two functions, right? We know the, the, two, the coordinate transformations in both directions are known. The, the coordinate transformation and its inverse are known. And then we should say that the point P, our point P, has a, uh, a location in both systems, right? And so we would write X mu of the point P, right, that these, this is the coordinates of the point P in the X coordinate system, and the uh, coordinates of the point P in the zeta coordinate system will just be zero, right? We're going to put P at the origin of this coordinate system, which I guess would be equivalent to saying you would write that epsilon mu of X mu of p equals zero, right? Okay, so that's sort of the setup here. Although this part of the setup is a bit too restrictive. I mean, it's obviously convenient. We should do it that way. 
but uh, let's let's take that away, right? That's a little restrictive. Let's just uh, let's just say um, let's just say that uh, uh, epsilon epsilon. The reason is is I'm going to do a Taylor expansion, and it's going to be much easier if I do x mu of p. That's going to equal psi mu of p, right? So it's not going to be zero. I'm, that's going to help us with the Taylor expanding that we're going to do in a minute. Okay, so this is the setup. And uh, now we are going to study these assumed functions, which exist because we're dealing with a manifold. So we know we have them. We know they're well-behaved, right? It's a differentiable manifold, which means it's well-behaved. So now we're going to write these guys uh, the Taylor expansion of these functions in terms of one of each other. A very common technique. So let's do that. So this is the Taylor expansion of our transformation equation, right? It's pretty simple to dissect, right? The first or the zeroth order term is, this is obviously a Taylor expansion of x about the point uh, x of p, right? About our are uh, the point of interest here, right? So it, it's simply the value of the transformation at the point x of p. And then we start taking the delta x, the, the coordinate difference between uh, uh, some point nearby xp and xp itself. And we go through each of those coordinates. Remember, this is all, and we, uh, we sum over this first derivative, the derivative of this being the derivative of this function, right? The, or the function, the actual function itself, we know its derivative. Remember, this is a function on x, right? So we can take its derivative with respect to x. The, uh, the function of the, the transformation equation from uh, the original coordinates x to our uh, coordinates that are inertial at p. We evaluate this at xp, you take this product, and you get the first order correction term. Now notice, I've kind of screwed this up already, right? that alpha there should be an eta, right? And this is a dummy index, right? That's summing over each of these possible derivatives. And this is the Jacobi matrix of the transformation, right? We've seen this before. This is your transformation matrix from the x coordinate um, to, you know, be the between the coordinates x and uh, psi, you have these matrices transform vectors and forms. This matrix and its reciprocal transform vectors and forms between these two things, right? So this is the derivative of this coordinate transformation. And then the second order term is just the same thing again, but now you're dealing with this, the uh, derivatives of the transformation matrix, right? And this is this the alpha, eta element of the transformation matrix. And so... In particular, right, uh, we would write down, say, the transformation of the metric itself from the x-coordinates, right? We have the metric in the x-coordinates, and we also have the metric um, in uh, the eta-coordinates, right? Presumably, this is the metric in the eta-coordinates, right? And this is the metric in the x-coordinates. In fact, I guess I should make a point. This, the, the coordinate system we're talking about in this case, of course, is the eta coordinate system. Here I'm using kind of the same mu's and nu's. It's not obvious, but I guess because it's circled in blue, you know that this is the eta coordinate system we're talking about. So uh, I could write the transformation of the metric, right? So I would write, uh, for example, g... Uh, let's say I did it this way, G A B of, of psi, uh, blah, 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 blah. wait a minute, let me, let me do it this way. It, the way we would write it is we would write G alpha beta, that is the metric in the X coordinate system, equals G A B, where A B is indices, um, that are telling us that this is the metric in the psi coordinate system. And then I need the transformation matrices that take a to beta, or oops, not a to beta, a to alpha, and uh, b to beta. So I'm using this sort of notation where it's very common that transformation matrices are given as lambda. But we know the definition of lambdas, the lambda uh, a to alpha is by definition 
the partial of these transformation equations, right? Uh, e a partial x alpha, right? That's the definition of these guys. So this this piece here is this transformation matrix right here, right? And uh, it's actually pretty convenient to, and it's telling, right? We're going to actually do some notation that leads us uh, down the path of, of exploiting our tetrad formulism. So I'm going to rename these two matrices. I'm going to rename these guys, and I'm going to call them, ready? I'm going to call them E, A, alpha, and E, B, beta, right? I'm, that's the name I'm going to give to them. So G, A, B is G, alpha, beta. Nothing here but notation, but this is going to uh, uh, smoothly segue into the notation of our tetrads, right? So uh, uh, that's what, so we have this, this Taylor expansion, by the way, is guaranteed to exist because we have a smooth differentiable manifold. We've got a lot of other terms out there that we're ignoring, but we're looking at the first two terms. And this guy here is these transformation matrices right here that we see that we're now going to call EAB. So I could actually rewrite this, right? I could rewrite this as, let's see if I can do this. I could rewrite this in the following way, right? I could rewrite this with the E here, in this form, right? So now that's E. And then I could take this guy, this more complex second derivative, which has one, two, three indices, right? I could take that guy and I could give it this, uh, this letter F, right? So I'm sort of bundling these things up now. All right, so let me gather this guy up here, squeeze him down and move him to the side. And let's go back and look at this cat. So in all fairness, I should remind everybody, well, not fairness, but just for clarity, that this uh, is a function on the x-coordinate system, and this is a function on the psi-coordinate system. Right, and these are functions on the co those coordinate systems too. Right, these this transformation here, right, that's also a function of uh, of, of the coordinates as well. But we won't bother writing it that way. Um, the point being, though, is that now we invoke our Einstein equivalence principle, and what we're going to say is. We're going to look at what we're going to say is that this expression, of course, is the same thing here. But now I put in the coordinates of the point P in uh, on the left hand side and the coordinates of point P on the right hand side in the respectively appropriate coordinate systems, psi and x. But we know what this is, right? We know what this is because of our oops, because of our assumptions, right? Our assumptions here, or I guess I should say our assumptions right here. We know that at the point P in the coordinate system we're building now, we've got these Cartesian Minkowski coordinates. So I can now write this as equals eta, oops, not alpha beta, eta a b psi of p. Um, well, not even a to a, b, psi of p, right? It's just a to a, b, right? At this point, right? At this point, and then I go e, a, alpha, e, b, beta. And now we just look at this and say, well, you know, this is a matrix equation, so we can think of these as uh, four by four matrices, right? So they're invertible. So we can now write expressions like e, a, alpha, and then we define its inverse to be e, alpha, a, right, and uh, that is going to uh, uh, be, since it's an invertible matrix, it's going to be delta alpha, or delta A alpha, right? That's the way we'll, that's the way we'll handle this notation. Alternatively, we could do E, and I think I did this in the previous lectures, E A alpha, um, the inverse would be something like E inverse, right? I would actually literally write E inverse and and uh, uh, give it its own indices. But what we'll do is just by reversing the indices, that's good enough, right? We'll, we know that this is an invertible matrix, and if you swap the A with the alpha, you'll get its inverse.
I guess I would write this as E uh, inverse alpha. I guess I would use the same same letters, right? E inverse alpha A like that, and it would still be delta A alpha, right? So we're thinking of these guys now as matrices. The point there, of course, is I can rewrite this equation as G alpha beta at X of P. I'm going to drag that X of P around because that's so critical. This, this statement here isn't true anywhere else. Right? That's the Einstein equivalence principle. So I'll just write that Einstein equivalence principle, right? And then I write E alpha A, E beta B equals eta A B, right? Now, in previous lectures, I know this would have ended up with a lambda, right? And lambda, in, you would have lambda inverses here, I think, right? And we have to think, okay, what's the core to transformation where, where these guys are actually transforming from the, psi, the uh, xi coordinate system to the x coordinate system, right? So there's a variety of notations here. And this is the first time we've kind of gone down this road, but this is the best road for this purpose, right? So we're going to use it. I'm just going very carefully step by step. But the point is, is that... Um, in the x-coordinate system, right? Remember, in the x-coordinate system, at the point P, the metric just has some value. And it's, you know, you could organize the metric as a matrix, right? You could say it's got, it's a four by four matrix. Um, it's dangerous to think of the metrics as literally a matrix, but if you organize the components, the mu nu components where, as a, uh, as a grid, let's call it a grid as opposed to a matrix, it would, you know, it, it may or may not be diagonal in its original form. If, for example, if this was the, the Schwarzschild geometry and these were Schwarzschild coordinates, then this would, in fact, be a diagonal metric to start with. But if it's the Kerr geometry of a spinning black hole or something, then it has off-diagonal elements too. And if it's an arbitrary metric, it will definitely have... The only thing you'll know is that it's symmetric, right? The only thing you know is that it's symmetric. And it's non-degenerate, right? Symmetric and non-degenerate, but um, uh, but it's arbitrary, right? I mean, this is an arbitrary coordinate system, so this metric value here, we make no assumptions about it whatsoever. But what we do know when we see this is that these two guys diagonalize and normalize this to the uh, Minkowski Cartesian metric. So these guys diagonalize and normalize um, the uh, the metric at that point at least. So our next steps, which we'll do in the next lecture, is we're going to start from here and we're going to start from what's an interesting use of the transformation equation of the connection. And we are now going to explore uh, how to establish the Riemann normal coordinates. And, what, and the hint is these two guys here are actually, notice the way these are written, as I alluded to earlier, these look like a tetrad, right? This looks like the, you might write E, um, E A equals E A alpha partial alpha, right? This is the expression of the tetrad basis in terms of the coordinate basis. Or in our language, it's going to be um, the uh, a basis suitable for the psi coordinate system, which is this inertial coordinate system, compared to just the coordinate basis. And so this is going to be vectors that are very, very well adapted to the Riemann normal coordinates. And we see them emerging already. And we'll talk about how you go from this to this. Because remember, this is, this is now a matrix because we've got two indices on it, right? Normally you would just have E alpha partial alpha for a single vector. But we're talking about four vectors, each labeled with a little number A like that, right? which in some notations is given like this, and other notations is given with a little hat. And in still other notations, it's just Latin letters, right? So that's going to be our next step. This lecture has gotten a little long, right? Because I spent a lot of time going through some of the axiomatic stuff. I don't mind repeating myself, right? I'm happy to repeat myself a lot. We've already done something important here. We've looked at uh, expanding these transition functions in Taylor series. We're going to do a lot of Taylor series expanding uh, as we go through this, and as we, when we finally get back to our interpretation of the curvature scalar, expanding in Taylor coordinates is a huge, in Taylor uh, series, 
It's a huge part of this whole exercise. Okay, so in the next lesson, we are going to start from here and keep driving to this, and we're going to exploit this non-tensorial uh, transformation. I'm going to talk a little bit, too, about uh, the tensor part of the transformation and then the non-tensor part of the transformation, too. But reviewing old principles, like the Einstein equivalence principle, as we've gotten more and more advanced in our work, going back and reminding ourselves of some of the fundamentals, which we spent a lot of time here doing, the transformation equations for a tensor, for example, um, that's all worth it. And I don't, uh, I don't mind dwelling on it a little bit.